straight into um, the uh, presentation this morning, Scott County Delivers, School Linked Mental Health. Good morning, Leslie. Take us away. Mr. Chairman, um, yeah, thanks for the, the introduction. And, and I just wanted to introduce or say a couple things. I, I always enjoy Scott Delivers and everything we learn and what it brings forward and the good things we do for our community. But um, when I read this one, boy, did it, it ever hit home. One, I have a ninth grader who's in special ed and has used some of Dr. Raditz's service over the years and what a godsend that was for us and, and for his support. And then as I was reading things like four-hour response times and how high those are and the things you do for kids, my husband is a, a special ed in a level four school. And so what he deals with and some of the things and that you have this in place, um, I actually had him read it and he was just amazed at some of the things you're doing because he's not in a school district that has some of that. And so how lucky we are to be able to do this and that we provide these for our kids as we hear more and more of that and that our county board has even put mental health um, as an objective and a strategy that they're working with, I think says a lot to what you're doing and the partnerships you've developed. Um, and I just thought it was a fascinating read and, and such an interesting process that you're going through and so wanted to say thank you for that. But with that, I'm going to have Barb start and introduce herself and we'll go around and then you guys get four or five minutes to intro your program and then um, we'll ask some questions. We'll open it up to the audience and then we'll close with the board's questions. So, Barb? Um, Barb Dahl, Social Services Director. <laughs> I'm Tanya Ward. I'm a supervisor <coughs> at the Mental Health Center. Terry Raditz, I'm the Director of the Mental Health Center. Tony Boothy, Director of Educational Services at the New Prague Area Schools. Amy Johnson, I'm the Director of Special Services for New Prague. Darren Kermis, Superintendent of Southwest Metro Intermediate District. Suzanne Arnson with Health and Human Services. Cindy Geist with Property and Customer <coughs> Services. Brad Davis, Planning. And then Leslie Brimley, the Deputy Administrator. All right, well, thank you, uh, Commissioners and panel, for the opportunity to come here and talk about uh, school-based, school-linked mental health. It's a passion for everyone at this table, I can say. And we're um, very fortunate, as you can see, to have really strong um, community partnerships. Uh, and I thank you for being here. Uh, so, Scott County Mental Health Center has a really long, 20 plus years, and successful um, history partnering with the school districts in Scott County. We are extremely lucky. Um, we've been able to work with our school districts in a way that uh, many counties and um, many school districts have not had um, partnership through the years. Um, <coughs> we have uh, therapists in 36 schools in Scott County. We have uh, a partnership with all of the districts in Scott County, except for the, those going to Burnsville School District because they have a separate contract with another provider. Um, what we provide in the schools is um, individual therapy, diagnostic assessment, family therapy, group therapy, and um, consultation and training to the schools. Um, the key to school-based mental health is the collaboration. What um, evidence-based practice shows and all the research shows are that the outcomes are dependent on the ability to collaborate with the schools, for the schools to accept you into, your, into their school, for the school social workers, the principals, the superintendents, the school counselors to work together. Um, and we are very fortunate to have that working relationship with the schools in Scott County. Um, you will hear when we, we go every uh, quarter to a school like mental health state meeting and we hear stories about how uh, people are attempting to work with schools and um, for whatever reason the schools don't feel comfortable having therapists in the schools. We don't have that problem. Each school it has a different culture and it's important for the therapist to understand that culture and to work within the culture. Um, the uh, school-based mental health is funded through third-party payments so we bill insurance for everything that's billable. Um, second, we have a school link mental health grant, which we've been fortunate to have for the past 15 years, which funds um, students who don't have insurance, who don't have mental health coverage, who have deductibles that are very high and um, based on their ability to pay aren't able to cover those, and also for the services that aren't covered by insurance, such as consultation and training. Um, and then the third, um, the, the third method of payment are contracts with the districts. We are also very fortunate that over the past four years, our districts have recognized that um, the, the need is greater than the um, amount of time that we had <clears throat> available, and so they've contracted with us for additional therapists in the schools. Um, 
And that has been great. We, uh, up until four years ago, we had one, two, or three days in each district. That, that's, that's not a lot of time for as big as the school <coughs> districts are. Um, but we've recently, um, well, we, I think we've added 10, which you know, because you approve those, but we've added uh, 10 positions in the schools um, through the contracts with the school districts, um, which I think clearly shows a strong commitment to mental health and, and for kids uh, doing better and doing well. In the 16-17 um, school year, we saw 819 youth in schools. We did 12,000 sessions of therapy and did um, 13 hours of service in the schools. Um, so we're pretty proud of that. Um, the Mental Health Center operates in the schools um, while we're embedded in part of that school culture and part of that team, which is so important. We operate as though we're an extension, like a satellite of the Mental Health Center. It, um, and so we do all of the things that are needed for medical necessity and for, the, for um, service and therapy as is um, demanded by statute, including we, the parents obviously give consent before we see a student. Um, the parents contribute to the diagnostic assessment and they participate and sign the treatment plans. And every 90 days at, at a maximum, often more often than that, we meet with parents to, to talk about the treatment plan and the goals for the student. So the parents and families are very much involved. We um, measure outcomes in many ways. Uh, we have, um, we do the SDQ, um, which is a, a measure of student functioning, and the CASI, which is a me measure of level of care needed for the student, as well as the GAF, and any other kind of standardized outcome measurement that shows how a student is functioning. For instance, if they have depression, we'll do depression scales. If, we, um, if they have anxiety, we'll do anxiety scales regularly. We do it at the beginning of therapy and at the end of this therapy, and at least every six months, often more in between that. So we have lots of outcome data to, um, to show that this is going well and all of our, uh, for our students and that they're getting better. All of our outcome measures show um, positive change and that they're, they're doing better. The, um, some of the measures that we do are given um, to the student, to the parents, to the teachers, and to the social workers. So we're measuring their, their um, estimate of the functioning and the change in the symptoms. The things that we're seeing in terms of outcomes, um, we see increased um, attendance in school, increased grades, fewer symptoms, uh, less, um, less uh, absenteeism, we have fewer um, discipline referrals, and um, improved graduation rates, and um, of course, uh, improvement in mental health. Um, also functioning, the measures also measure functioning with peers, social functioning, school functioning, and family functioning, and we have positive outcomes um, in all of those areas. Um, let's see, anything else I, well, I can talk a little bit about what we know, both our, um, our experience but, uh, and our research, but also the data from the state and national um, school mental health um, study centers show that when you have a mental health provider, a therapist, in the school, it reduces stigma. The, um, <clears throat> the students are, are accustomed to the therapist being there. And of course, we, we, we protect confidentiality. We don't you know, have a big sign that says therapist. And so the, any child walking in there, the, <coughs> the other students see that. But the therapists attend um, the back to school nights. Mm -hmm. They go to the um, different um, gatherings that the school has. And they, they go to the classroom. Um, such as health class and the talk about mental health or on mental health um, stigma reduction week or bullying week. Um, they go to the classroom so the students get to know them. We get a lot of referrals that way. We frequently will have a student come and bring a friend and say they really need to see you. Um, and that's a great thing to see when uh, kids are reaching out to their, um, their peers and um, helping them to get the support they need. Um, it also really increases awareness of mental health and research shows that within the school, the, um, the level of, of understanding and awareness of the early signs of mental health with teachers so that they make those referrals early um, goes up substantially. Um, we have been fortunate because all of the districts have asked us to um, do training every year and sometimes multiple times through the year about 
mental health, early warning signs, how to work with kids with mental health and trauma in the classroom, and how to have a trauma-informed um, school. And um, that is wonderful. But also, the therapists learn so much from the school. We learn about um, how the school works with kids. They're the experts in behavior. We learn. We can see the kids with their peers. We can see the kids with the, in their classrooms with their teachers. And we can work together as a team. Um, and of course, also with the family. Um, so it increases collaboration um, and consultation. Um, already this year, we've done two trainings uh, invited by um, Southwest Metro and another school district and done two trainings on suicide awareness and prevention for the school staff, um, which is a big um, push. And um, the state is aware that that's something we want to be working on. I think we trained, what, Tanya, maybe three or 400 people, mm -hmm. uh, uh, school staff, um, already this fall. Um, and finally, it really um, decreases uh, trauma for students because we're able to provide services in school, in the community. They can stay in their home rather than, you know, going in an ambulance to the hospital or being placed outside the home in the community, and we, which we know is really traumatic. And we want to get there early and be able to provide those um, services. So um, that's my summary. I'll stop talking now. Thank you. Uh -huh. I will open it up to the panel. Cindy, Suzanne, Brad. I just have an overarching question. As I was looking at some of these statistics, and they're so positive, so great job. I, you know, we have to commend you for all the hard work that you're doing. Do you have any data that would show these students as they transition out of the high school into maybe the workforce or post high school education on what the impact has been? to them with the services that you've provided? Well, we don't have um, systematic data. We have um, the data from, because we continue to work, just like we work with kids year round, some are not just in school, we also work with them after they graduate. So we know um, from our statistics about outcomes, but we don't know specifically kids in the school linked programs. We could probably work on that. Thank you. I guess along that same vein, so when you, I know Terry, when you talk about your, the GAF score, the Global Assessment of Functioning, it takes into <coughs> consideration sort of the school domains around grade <coughs> school performance. Is there opportunity to sort of merge like your Global Assessment of Functioning alongside school records, grades, attendance to, to sort of overlay both those um, performance measures? Well, I can speak to that from the, from the Department of Education, the Par Department of Human Services. They do that. So when we get our reports back, they, they have a contract where they merge that data. Um, we are very careful about confidentiality, and so um, we're careful about MARS numbers and um, PMI numbers and those sorts of things, but the, the state is studying that and doing that. I think that's a good, I think we want to really develop some outcome measures locally. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have thoughts about how we might be able to do that. Do you want me to? Yeah. Well, um, what I would say too is I think there's a lot more open collaboration and communication amongst the therapists in the schools and with our evaluation teams. And so when we have uh, confidentiality, you know, being sensitive to that, but when we have a release of information that's signed, you know, there is a lot more open communication so that we know what recommendations the therapists are working on. So that way it's seamless, you know, what the kids are getting. And I would say, you know, it's not necessarily directly answering your question about data post-secondary, but we have seen um, a decrease in the kids that are waiting for therapy, having the therapist actually be in the schools. And we've also seen an increase in kids being dismissed from therapy, you know, versus uh, before in the past when kids would be going out seeking therapy outside, it would, it would follow along with them. And we've seen a lot more, uh, I would say, benefit from having everything co-located together so that the agencies, even, you know, sometimes there would be communication, of course, with a different agency that wouldn't be necessarily located within the schools, but because the partners would be together, we really see uh, the therapist as a name. We don't really just see them as a therapist. They're part of our team. They're part of our staff. And so because of that close working relationship, we've seen more benefit for kids than even going from an elementary school to then to a middle school that maybe they don't need that extra layer of support anymore because they've gotten that early intervention. So kind of both of your questions, yeah, that helps. I'll stay on that page five. The, um, the global assessment of functioning seems to be an important outcome <coughs> for you. And on this particular slide, I was just curious on the time frame. This is showing students that have um, 
been seen and it appears that they've been tested at, at a certain point and then shown improvement, no change or a decrease. When was that testing done? Was it at 2015 and then again <coughs> 2016 or are these um, clients that have been in um, being seen over a long period of time? So this particular measure, um, the GAF, that's the only one that we do when they start and when they end. So that's done, you know, at the beginning of therapy and after they've finished. So it would be whatever period of time. Um, so with these, we have this for years, years worth of data, but this is for this time period, kids that started and ended within that time period. Okay, and what's the average length of time that students might be seen? Uh, uh, that's a good question. Maybe yeah, nine months to a year. Just, it really depends. Some kids come in, meet their goals, have a lot of change and um, move on, but I would, I would think probably nine months. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. It's very, yeah, it just really depends. Mm -hmm. yeah. and we can get you that data. That's fine. <laughs> and have you ever dug deeper into the data to see how this outcome looks across age groups or grades or gender? I know in some other uh, information it looks like females have some disproportionate um, issues around mental health and so have you been able to kind of look at this data and broke that out by gender or age? We can do we can do that. Um, I don't have that with me but um, yeah we can um, pull out the data for age and even for communities and diagnosis and all of those things. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular question though? It was probably on the female gender question whether you see generally more improvement or, or less improvement with females versus males. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's a particular difference. Um, often, male students are um, more referred for behavioral um, concerns, and female maybe for the more internalizing depression and anxiety. Although we're seeing a really a big change with that, mm -hmm. with um, um, the schools really. Um, all the other grants are jealous of us because our. Um, our school social workers and school staff are so knowledgeable about mental health that they we get referrals for trauma and anxiety and depression um, versus all <coughs> behavioral referrals. Mm -hmm. So I, I think um, outcomes are probably pretty equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now you made me curious and I'm going to run that. <laughs> <laughs> What I'd be curious around sort of that same thing of looking at youth from underrepresented populations and um, in terms of numbers served, does that look um, equal or consistent to broader populations? And then from a recovery standpoint, are there differences within that? I have a question about page six. It looks like there was a, a decrease in the improvements between uh, 13, it went up in 14, went back down in 15. Can you explain any reasons why the data that you've, that there wasn't an improved uh, improvement across the board? It looks like you're back up at the end of 2016, but was it a staffing issue or was there a change in how GAF was administered? Um, yes, so all of those things. Well, not a staffing issue, but um, it's not a statistically significant change, but it is a, it's a change. It was a drop during that time. And what we just, we have so many clients that it takes a big difference to make it it's statistically significant. But what was happening is that we had um, our psychiatrist and um, our psycho psychologist who only see uh, people for evaluation and you wouldn't expect change. We were including their their GAF scores which we shouldn't have been because you're not ex when you're doing an evaluation, you're, you're not doing intervention, so you're not expecting a before and after change. And so we improved our data collection at that point. Um, and no, because we were getting a lot of gaps where, you know, they were only there for one day and you're not expecting it to go up. One, one follow-up question with that on this slide. When I look at this and I was reading some about, about this measure, it looks like the range is a 1 to 100 as far as the severity of the issues that this student has. Are there different successes and are there more dramatic successes for those if you were in a GAF range of 1 to 25 or 25 to 50, 50 to 75, 75 to 100? 
is it fairly level at the higher range? I would, I mean, just me, I would expect it to be maybe because they're more stable. And are there some more dramatic changes in people who are at the lower level? I'm curious as to know once the intervention has t taken place and there's assistance is being provided, if some of those students who are in that lower, the more uh, at risk stage, if you saw a greater improvement with them. Well, we hope for greater improvement with them. I, I think you're right that because, um, you know, the lower ranges are, you know, be, they're suicidal, they're, they're not safe, they're, they're at risk of hospitalization or are in the hospital, and then they would move up from there. We don't see very many, um, we don't get clients often that are at the highest levels. Um, we hope that they end at, you know, at the high levels, okay. but, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to comment on that? Or? Yeah. I, I think the the assessment's pretty standardized, and so it gives pretty clear um, delineations of each of the ranges. And so I think um, when we take into effect the, the clients who come to the, the kids in the schools, they're typically functioning at a, a level, and so because um, they're in school, so that kind of provides a, a baseline of usually where they start just by nature of where the referral come from and kind of how they're functioning. Because for a kid, you know, their main job is school, so that really would be part of how we measure that, that GAF score. And so I do see it pretty consistent um, based on, you know, the growth that they do in the schools. So. So I kind of look at this like towards zero death, right, in my background in highways. That's our goal, even though we might not ever make it there. What would it take to get this to 100%? Well, that's a really good question. Um, so this is improvement, right? You know, percentage of, uh, of clients showing improvement. We would want it to be 100%. Sometimes, um, well, just by the nature of the intervention we do, maybe they come in and they're suicidal and we send them to the hospital. And so that's a success, but their, their functioning doesn't go up while we're seeing them. So statistically, that would be hard to do. I think probably uh, resources. If you're, if you know, looking at with what we're doing, um, would get it as close as we could to um, the best outcomes that we could. And I would say, say resources. Well, go ahead. well, I was just going to chime in and say earlier, the better too. As we all know, mm -hmm. early intervention and identification is key. And right now, just in what we see, our highest numbers are at the elementary. But I think that's because we have a an educated referral team. You know, and working closely with that. So the you know, to increase that improvement rate, the earlier we can get in, the better, so that we can give them the tools that they can then cope and function in their environment and be able to have those relationships and be successful in their learning. Have we always had them in the elementary school? So it's kind of leading to the question, are we tracking then or looking at, since we've had them in the elementary school, will we expect to see some decline then in junior high or high school? Are we measuring or looking at that outcome? Yes. And I am, I'm, I am at our level, looking at ours, and right now, you know, our elementaries are higher than our middle school, high school, and, you know, that could be based on referrals, it could be based on even, um, you know, if they're receiving services outside the school, that's always a parent choice too, you know, but just trying to look at if we're seeing a consistent amount of decrease, so that's going to take some years yeah, to track that. it'll take time, but mm -hmm. we are. And we've just recently started providing therapy in the elementary schools. Mm -hmm. With yep. the expansion through the contracts, yeah. mm -hmm. you're now in the shock of the elementaries also. Yeah. Why is the referral, do you think, easier at the elementary than at the high school? You kind of say, if there's easier or more, is there? Well, I think there's more options once kids get into that more adolescent stage for them to receive therapy <coughs> outside. So if parents already pursued that. You know, part of that is just looking at what is a parent choice, so what is something that's more convenient. The wonderful thing about school-located services is that if we have a family um, structure that really are, they're finding it difficult to get to therapy outside of the school day, you know, that they're, they've been able to access that during the school day. And, of course, it doesn't pull away from any of the new instruction or learning happening at school. We work closely with that, you know, to be cognizant about scheduling. But I do think it's, it's new. It's newer. Even though it has been happening for the past 20 years, I think having more full-time therapists in the school is newer. And so just trying to educate and, again, like uh, Dr. Raditz referred, you know, it's not, there's not a stigma anymore. It's more of a name. It's a face. It's not necessarily a therapist or therapy. So trying to decrease that stigma too is important. I can tell a cute story about that. 
we, uh, we hired a new therapist who happens to live in Elko, and he has a program uh, <coughs> in one of the schools in Elko, <coughs> in in Elko and he shared with us that uh, his little girl came home and said, if you, have, if you have feelings, if you have emotions, if you have things that you want to talk with, you get to see Sammy. There's a therapist there, so kids get to go and see Sammy. And we just felt so happy about that, that it's a positive thing that, that, uh, that kids are seeing as just part of their school. Uh, you know, our goal, obviously, is to have um, mental health preventive work and mental health um, intervention the same as physical health, that it's something that's positive and not stigmatized and not something that um, you have to hide or you don't want to tell anyone about. Um, so that was, that was real positive for us to hear that. The, one other question, do you have statistics or numbers of people that have been <coughs> referred to <coughs> you as, as providers that refuse services? And what do you think the biggest roadblock or challenge is to invite that person to uh, talk to, with you? I have a response from you guys. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I guess the biggest thing is, you know, just education, awareness about that this is a, a help, it's a service that will help you. Sometimes, too, another, you know, um, sometimes teenagers, kids in the high school are nervous about opening up. Sometimes it's a fit. You know, if there was maybe a, a therapist that wasn't the best fit in the past, then they're a little more hesitant and anxious about opening up again. So there's a number of different reasons why, but a lot of it is education and, again, goes back to that relationship. Once they see them as, oh, this is somebody with my teachers, this is somebody with my counselor, with my social worker, this is a safe person, this is a secure person, you know, that helps too. So sometimes it just takes time, you know, and just, again, building that relationship and, and really fostering that, that uh, um, that resource is a positive thing versus a negative thing. It will be nice to see if there were statistics since you're in the elementaries now, mm -hmm. because you are out there doing outreach to these kids at a very young age, and if they're going to be growing up with, mm -hmm. this is nothing more than going to talk with my parents right. or going to talk with my best friend, and they see that more of is just an imitation, if you'll see maybe that trend line of people refusing services when they get into the junior or high school. Yeah area where they're probably the most vulnerable because they're impressionable mm -hmm. uh, and they're 12 going on 21 absolutely. so don't tell me what I don't know absolutely <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely I gotta ask what are pages 11 and 12 and I know it's only two marks but those are some pretty steep curves what is that telling you and what did it look like Pre 2013, was it ladder <coughs> coming into that, or? Well, that's a really that's a good question because those are public health. Those are from the student survey um, from the schools, and um, it was just suggested that we add that just to show the need. Um, so those those aren't our data, but they're the student survey data. So I don't really know. Um, Lisa, do you know if it was prior to 2013? Um, we have historical data. 15 years on ninth graders, so if I could pull that information. Um, but we, we were quite surprised by the dramatic increase in many of the measures on ninth graders related to mental health, um, particularly self harm, uh, attempted suicide, or consent uh, suicide. So we certainly can pull that data to see. Um, I was actually going to ask if you have any speculation of why there was such a dramatic increase um, in these measures. Yeah, that's what is it telling you? Why oh, I think we weren't really, well, surprised, always surprised. But uh, it's, I, we think in our observations, and I really want to hear from the school folks, that I think it's the opening up of the dialogue. We've seen with little, even little children, and those of you who came to my talk about <coughs> Side for Fish, it's part of, um, for some kids, the way they talk now, they say, um, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to kill myself. And then when we meet with them, um, they're talking about being frustrated. And we talk about why, you know, why are, you know, what do you really mean? What's under that? Do you really want to die? Um, and we find that it's, there's just with social media and with um, a lot of things that are, that are going on, um, some of this is really good in the sense that the stigma is reduced. People are talking about it. They're talking about these thoughts and feelings. And so um, people are just 
uh, kids are much more open to sharing those kinds of thoughts. Um, we're seeing that in practice, that um, it's not uncommon to get a referral for um, a student um, or a, a youth <coughs> or a for them and say they're saying that they're uh, suicidal. We certainly take that very seriously, but then we find out what's under, under that. There's a lot of reasons that kids say that, <coughs> and uh, um, there's a lot of talk about that on social media. And so mm -hmm. while it's surprising, it's also in some ways, um, I mean, it's not great, but it, in some ways it's, it's really fortunate that um, this, this conversation is out there. And like I said, the schools have already uh, had us come and talk to the, um, to the staff about identifying um, those kinds of behaviors and <coughs> thoughts and changes um, early on in, within the, the child's life. One thing that this mirrors also is if you look at the trend line of the number of individuals that have been served by the men mental health center, it is mirroring that. I mean, we don't have a, a way to know or identify, you know, which kids are identifying themselves as having these needs. But it does, it, and, and you can see through how many additional staff that we've added regarding school and mental health, we've continued to kind of respond to that need within the community between 2013 and 2016. We've had to grow that service, grow that support. So again, we, we don't know if it's, it's a direct correlation of, of answering that need, but it would seem to kind of parallel um, the request that we've received from the districts on that. I would say when we got our Minnesota student survey data, we said the same thing at first initially looking at how many students reported those concerns and how many students were actually ac accepting services. But then once we delve into that with our mental health team, we really realized it was more like Terry said, uh, or Dr. Reddit said, it was more of an opening in the dialogue and then ac accessing the services, which we saw as more of a positive thing. And so having the counselors, the social workers, part of that discussion too, that really were in the trenches, they were in agreement with that based on what we saw for New Prague. I would echo that. I think the knowledge and stigma, the knowledge piece that, that well, and from the stigma side, it's not we should hide away. It's there. this is an issue that maybe we need help with. It has really started to shift more to that physical health type situation where it's easy to say, hey, I've got a sprained wrist, I've got a broken ankle, you know, to go get help for that. But when it was mental health, it was, no, this is a flaw. This is a weakness. This is, I can't share this. And I think we're starting to see a bit of a trend more towards a, no, this could be something that is a problem and it's maybe not a weakness on my part and maybe it's something that I can get help and see some positive results on. That's part of the barrier that's being torn down. And I think the other thing that I would say, not directly on this point, but as I go to meetings with superintendents across the state, there is tremendous jealousy out there, and I say jealousy in a good way, of what we have going here in Scott County. The, the access to the service, the getting the folks <coughs> in early, the not being afraid to share data and work collaboratively with kids is something that you do not see across the state. You know, we hear a lot about scale, how Scott County is unique for scale. I would suggest to you that it's every bit as unique, if not more unique, when it comes to the mental health relationship between the Scott County leadership and team and our school district folks. It's very much parallel scale in that way. Just uh, paint a little bit of a picture for those of us that graduated around the 70s and the 80s and then taught in the 90s and here we are today, we're trying to raise our kids in, in our communities and with social media and such. <clears throat> the big picture of starting teaching almost 30 years ago were there were therapists but they definitely weren't in the schools and everything that's been said today the collaboration between i don't i don't have a lot of the statistics in front of me but meeting with parents teachers kids community members for the last 30 years and the collaboration between our schools and i can only speak for new prague but we we kind of got our idea from shakopee when they started the collaboration for these kids and the help that we can provide them and the families has continued to grow in the New Prague area schools, which of course is Scott County, are unbelievable. And for the bang for the buck for taxpayers, this program that we have where we were able to bring in full-time therapists into our school, education has also changed, which many of you understand. And as a parent, 
education has changed, we need to be able to stay ahead of these kids and the issues. We've talked about when, back in the day, back in the 80s and maybe even 70s, and Darren brought it up, it was a stigma to talk to a counselor. Why did you have to go to a social worker? What's going on? I wonder what kind of family that is, those types of things. All we have to do is read in the paper, we're trying to break down those walls. And if we can get support and help even beyond what our schools are providing, but if we can collaborate and work together with the county such as we have, we're seeing unbelievable um, intervention with our families, with the kids, and they're able to come to school and to survive because a lot of times maybe they're, they're having some struggles and school might be one of them, but there's also the things at home. Um, but this has been an unbelievable year or two years since Amy and Terry have brought this into New Prague. And I can tell you our district administrators, our principals, they love having the therapists within. When I was the director, we had one, two, or maybe even three days. They were in, they were out. We really didn't know what kids they were seeing. They didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, input with what else was going on within our schools. This full-time therapist piece is unbelievable. And the, and the more we can do to keep these within all of our schools, um, you are helping kids big time as far as parents, the mental health piece, the whole picture, because we are working together. It isn't just that therapist steps in. We know exactly who they are. They know who we are. And uh, we're working a whole lot smarter than we are harder. And I wouldn't say we were doing that 20 years ago. Darren, you mentioned uh, data sharing, and that raises a question. How, how um, are you able to share data about a student as they move out of the district to maybe another district in the county or outside the county? Is that a difficult task to be able to share what you've learned about that student, what interventions you've done? to another school if, if they inquired about it? From the therapist standpoint, we get a release of information from the parent signed um, and um, to share that information with the new district. Um, and I think the school does a similar thing. Okay, <laughs> same thing. Mm -hmm. That information can follow the student as they go. Mm -hmm. Well, especially when you see the positive outcomes more often a parent is willing to share or be able to willing to sign that release going to a new entity when they've seen the positive and they want to see that carry forward. Mm -hmm. And so we really don't struggle that much at all getting mm -hmm. those kind of permissions to share that district. Now, not, it's not seamless, it's not perfect. Sometimes the parent has every right to say no and then we can't share it. Um, but most of the time it's, it's very uh, well received to go ahead and share that. Let's continue the momentum. Mm -hmm. On that same side, how does the services that you provide within the public school system, how does that roll out to some of the privates and charter schools within Scott County? Do you invite them to trainings and maybe you aren't physically located within those, those locations, but are, is there an outreach to those schools as well? Well, I can answer that. Um, being a person who pretty much leads our staff development within the New Prague Area Schools, and a lot of times with Darren, also at Southwest Metro, we really try and work together because kind of going back to what I said before, working smarter, not harder. If there's one thing we're doing better, and I would hope, the, I would say the county is the same way, but the schools is utilizing those. So we have two private schools within the New Prague Area Schools, and I can only speak for us, but I have a pretty good hunch that the majority of the other school districts also. Anytime we offer staff development, um, professional development, especially we'll just stay on the mental health, suicide training, anything that benefits students. We always invite our private school mm -hmm. folks. Mm -hmm. We always want our, the teachers to be there. Um, and things that we have at night, uh, Mr. Hosevar, who was at um, New Prague Schools last year, <clears throat> helping us put on a presentation. Um, anybody within our district and local school districts were also invited mm -hmm. To that presentation too so there are no walls when it comes to mental health there's no walls when it comes to support of students and parents 
and that's the great thing about us sitting here today, Darren uh, and Amy and I from a school district is we've never had this close a relationship. We've had great things, don't get me wrong. Terry's done a phenomenal job of bringing therapists into our schools. But now when we were able to actually even put up a little bit of finances from the New Prague schools, the services that our students and families are getting are top notch. Thank you. When you've got um, youth who are presenting potentially with mental health and chemical health, you talk a little bit from school perspective, like how you integrate those services or from the um, mental health side? Sure, well, I can start. Mm -hmm. uh, so when a student has it, uh, the first thing that happens is they have a diagnostic mm -hmm. assessment. And that diagnostic assessment looks at all aspects of their life and functioning. And so that looks, they look at the chemical health piece as well, maybe refer for those kinds of services. Um, and also, obviously, coordinating with the, um, the school staff and their chemical health staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just, you know, say, kind of chime in by saying the same thing. A lot of it, like we have a chemical health specialist in our district, and so there is collaboration amongst the therapists and the chemical health specialists that, you know, depending on what that student is working on, that they're on the same page with the treatment and therapy. Yeah. So on, on page <coughs> nine, um, if there's one thing I've learned through sitting through Scott Delivers the last three years, it's the timeliness of your responses, whether it appears to be child protection or mental health or law enforcement. Um, that's declining, and I'm not sure if it's significant or not, your four-hour response times. Is, is there a reason for that, or, or is that of concern that we're trending in that direction? Um, we, used to, we used to measure within eight hours. And then we went to four, so the um, because we we had 100% within eight hours. So what this is measuring is when someone calls in um, to the mental health center or presents in the mental health center, um, we offer them. Our goal is to offer them an appointment with four within four hours. Um, I think because of um, sometimes it's the issue that the client doesn't want to be seen that quickly they want to wait till after work or they want to be seen the next day so that impacts our stats i um i think the reason it went slightly down is just in terms of the number of um, staff that we have available uh, we're still seeing all of these people within eight hours and most of them within five or within four so 14 was actually eight hours not four hours then on this graph then and then we changed it because in the past it was eight and we changed it to four because we were doing we were make, getting a hundred percent and so we we upped the ante for us a little bit oh you mean year 14. yeah that was eight yeah. hours yeah so that corresponds to graph seven <coughs> then with that spike i'm assuming does that mm. impact that then yeah and we had um well, we have a couple of challenges, which you've heard about, as, in terms of rooms. And uh, we have um, a lot of therapists in only eight rooms at, in the mental health center. And so they're coordinating um, all of those pieces. Is there a space for them to be seen? Um, and um, the spike with um, the higher number of <coughs> clients also, obviously, makes it a little more challenging to see all those clients. You're referring to the high rise in clients in 16? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's <coughs> 1,300 people. Well, and part of that is um, we are measuring more accurately. We, as you may know, we got a new um, electronic medical record. And as part of that, we're able to measure every single client that we see. There were, so part of it is an artifact of that because um, previously, we, uh, if we were like with the jail, where we're working with the jail, we would have um, we wouldn't have every jail person that we saw register in our in our numbers, and now each <coughs> one is pulled out. So that accounts for some of that, but there's still a, a high uh, increase. Do these numbers reflect the school-based clients? They're part of that. Part of yeah. the number. Mm -hmm. So if you have a student that calls the mental health center, do you um, try to then match them with a therapist that might be in their school before? asking them to come up here to the medical health center? Um, yes and no. Uh, just to back up a little bit, um, most people want to be seen in the school when the school refers them or their parents refer them. They want to be seen at the school uh, because it's um, for the student instead of 
you know, traveling to St. Louis Park or something, they're, you know, there's, they, they miss one <coughs> class period, which as Amy said, we rotate so that they're not missing the same class period. But some people want to be seen at the mental health center for whatever reason. They don't want their child to be, they don't want to have therapy at school. They don't want um, that associated um, with the school. And so we do that. When we, we really, um, we really take our referrals from the school and the parents call and talk to the school about that because we don't have, we, we can't see everybody. And so if a parent calls and wants services at the mental health center, we see them at the mental health center. Uh, we don't automatically shift them to the school because we don't have enough resources to do that. So long answer to short question, but that's why. I have one other observation that I found interesting and I'm not entirely certain why. So we talked about the GAF scores on page six and how they've continued to kind of ebb and flow. And one of the things that I found out that I found interesting, looking at page six and looking at page eight, when we look at the clients who are agree or strongly agree that they're satisfied with the services, when the GAF scores went up or down in those years, I would have expected that the would recommend or progress would also go up, and they're opposite. So between 13 and 14 in GAF, you went from 70 to 78%, but yet the people who would recommend or made progress went down. Strange statistic. And 14 to 15, the same thing. The GAF scores went down, but would recommend and progress went up. So I just found that contradictory a little bit, and I was curious if, if you were able to kind of delve into that and say, what's making that tick, and what you see success here, and then and they don't find that they're that satisfied, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Well, again, um, because we have so many clients, it's not statistically that's not a significant difference. It certainly is a um, an interesting discussion to have. Um, uh, the it all it. Often clients may be very satisfied with their service or recommend it, but they may not meet all of their goals. And they may not, um, the therapist in doing the GAF functional assessment may not see them as having as much improvement as maybe they, they feel they have. And so it's, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation with um, you know, how satisfied you feel about your therapy and maybe how on each of those standardized measures you look um, and the other way around. Maybe you got much better, but you weren't, you know, you weren't 100% satisfied. Does that make sense? A little sure. Bit. And it looks like in, it looks like in 2016 is maybe the first time you started asking satis, uh, satisfaction for the um, students, or is that, is that students' parents that you're asking that question whether they were satisfied? Um, well, we've done um, client satisfaction surveys, the same one for like. Um, 30 years, mm -hmm. um, what we pulled the, the students, we just pulled them, them out of that data. And so it would just happen to, we were working with Evan on that, and it just happened to be that data that we pulled forward. But we can go back okay. and pull that, because it's really just pulling age of client out okay. and, and where they were seen. Yeah. One thing we did notice too, though, when looking at this, is that the would <coughs> recommend at least for the last three years, has continued to increase overall for the mental health center. And so the interesting thing is when clients self-identify as having to made progress within their therapy, that that number is actually a little bit lower than would recommend service. So even if they themselves aren't feeling better necessarily, they, they're still looking at potentially ref, ref, making referrals on the program, which we see as a positive, that they, they feel like it's, it's helping, but maybe just not them quite yet. Any other questions of the panel? Yeah. All right, how about from the audience? Claire, well, I know. <laughs> I'm just wondering about the um, difficulty or ease of finding therapists and when you are looking for them, what type of training and education is required? Uh, well, we hired licensed mental health professionals. So they're required to have a master's degree, um, at least a master's degree, in, um, and a license to practice um, therapy. And um, 
we do a lot of interviews, especially mm -hmm. as we're expanding. Um, we have lots of applicants, but we are very, um, very particular about who we hire, especially in, I mean, we always are, and all of us are, but when you're in the schools, it, it, you're very independent, and we feel like it's, it's really important that they have a lot of um, experience and expertise diagnosing children, with, which is um, much, um, in some ways, trickier than um, diagnosing adults, and um, we certainly want to be careful about that. So we do, we've interviewed, um, sometimes we'll interview um, more than 30 people to hire one therapist. They have high mm -hmm. standards for us. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Pam? Lisa? You guys answered them all. Asked them all. <laughs> that was a fascinating read. I still said. Could I, one final just question. Um, knowing that you know, it sounds like New Prague was fairly new to having therapists on full time into the schools. I'm not entirely certain when full time therapists were put into all these other schools. And now that you're in the elementary, what <clears throat> what do you want to bring back to this type of a setting five years from now that could help say, wow, because we went into all the schools, because we <clears throat> now are in the elementary schools, this is what the statistics are that we would like to show in five years. I can start. Um, there's, there's a lot of things. One of the things that we've been working on is we want to do a, um, a client satisfaction survey for the school staff so that we've already developed it, but we haven't implemented it because it would look different than, of course, the one that we give to the clients. So we want to we wanna see what the school is saying, what feedback they're giving us, what's working, what's not. Um, we want to implement th that this year. Um, we also want to work together on some of those outcomes, because sometimes it's a little tough to get that data from the state. So we want to know locally what kind of outcomes we're having um, in, the, in the schools, particularly. We know functionally, but we want to know um, with grades and um, in a more systematic way. So we'd like to do that. Um, and most of all, or maybe not most of all, but something that's, that's a big um, push in school link mental health is we want to become sustainable so that a lot of what you do in school-based mental health um, that makes it so effective <clears throat> are things that aren't paid for by insurance. It's like the, it's the consultation, it's the classroom observation, it's the um, training. And so um, at a state level and a federal level, we're really working with the insurance companies to have special um, kinds of um, benefit packages for school-based mental health. And we're having some success with that um, because, um, you know, we may not always have a grant to cover those things. And so we want to be sure that we can continue this model um, without having to rely on grant funding. You would, uh, yeah, what are the schools yeah, hoping for? Yeah. Well, I'll jump in. You know, Leslie, you mentioned towards the zero fatalities. I'd love to be out of a job, and I'm sincere about that. I mean, it, to the intensity of the kids we get in the intermediate district, if the more is done at the elementary level and then at the district level, the less need there is for those <coughs> hyper intense services where the kids' needs are so significant they can't even function well within their neighborhood school. So put me out of job, put me out of work, I'd rather go fishing. I mean, <laughs> that, that's, if you want a goal and a target, that's what I'd love to see. I think the biggest thing too, just sorry, nope. do you want to, um, is, you know, we always track dismissal rates. We always track student progress. I think post-secondary is important. You know, we want to see how these kids, and we have our own data that we have to submit based on kids and how well they do after graduation. And then also we have the Minnesota Student Survey that we complete. And so some of that data and information will be compiled and reviewed. The other thing I think school districts are doing, and I know for our school district, they do, they have to do district goals for the year. A lot of it's been focused on academic math and reading. You know, our district is now, there's a third tier that is more social emotional learning and well-being, making sure students feel secure and safe and supported in their school. Um, and so having that accountability too at the district level is very important. So those would be the things that, and you know, we can track numbers, we can track some of that, but I think also those anecdotal, those stories that parents and students share and compiling some of that too can also paint the picture of what 
truly each student, each family is experiencing when they have that type of support and service. So, yeah. Yeah, I'll take a shot at that one. Um, <clears throat> it's getting harder. It's getting harder to raise our kids, um, and we all kind of have reasons why. Um, the social media, what goes on out in the communities, what our kids bring to the schools is different than when we were in school, if that makes sense. Um, we need cities, counties, state, federal government, whomever to help us with that. So to come back here in five years, number one, I would say we would want to be able to say our collaboration with this county is phenomenal. But we've also reached out to other uh, governmental agencies to be able to help us because when they come to us in the school, we are helping the, to, with their needs there. Why? Why are so many kids from 30 years ago having mental health issues? Why is there more um, depression? Why is there more anxiety? Um, why are our kids coming to school this way? And we need the support of folks like you to help us within the schools. Because we're, we're the place where they all come. But our job is to educate. Um, we realize a lot of things are getting in the way of education at a very early age. And the intervention at a very early age is so helpful to us so we can get our teachers back to teaching. And we can't continue to, you know, sometimes the numbers, one of the biggest things is uh, no waiting lists. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can come back in five years and say no child that has a need is waiting. You sure hate to go to the emergency room and they tell you to come back in a week or two when a spot opens up. And sometimes those are the <coughs> things that we have dealt with in the past and it's gotten a lot better because of the full-time therapists, but we have needs within the schools and we need your support. I, I have one more question. Um, when you have to bill the private insurance, who does the billing and the collection and how difficult has that been? We do that, um, and we do that, you know, we're a, a mental health clinic, and so it's really part of our um, structure. So when, a, <coughs> when a, um, the school makes a referral or a family refers their child, there's a form they fill out, and it, it gives their name and um, their insurance and permission to see the child and to build the insurance. And then we have this wonderful person named Cindy Whitman, who's um, our insurance expert, and she calls <coughs> each family and talks to them about what their insurance looks like, what that would mean. You know, we don't want to have a, a barrier of a billing insurance or a copay or money getting in between that child getting service and, um, and, and their access to that. So we, um, she talks with them and works out um, the details so they know what happens. It, it hasn't been difficult because we do that for all our clients. And so, um, and we don't want the school to be the school social worker who is at that <coughs> school conference and making that recommendation um, or giving that resource. We don't want them to have to, to deal with all of those financial insurance things because that's not their world. And so um, Cindy's the resource for that. It's, I think it goes very smoothly. Yeah, yeah and if there's, yeah. if there's information or if there's service that the insurance doesn't pick up or the grant can't pick up, the school's made a commitment to then pick up that cost too. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure the kids get what they need. Mr. Chairman. Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> Lisa, do you feel compelled to ask a question? I do feel compelled to ask one last question. <laughs> um, from evidence that we see in what Dr. Wilcox talked about last week, there's a lot of comorbidity between alcohol and illicit drug use, particularly around children with mental health and self-medicating. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, is that a trend that you are also seeing in the children that you're serving and the youth that you're serving? Well, yeah, I don't think that that's yeah. nothing new. I mean, yeah. it's a, yeah. um, we certainly see a lot of kids with <clears throat> chemical health issues, and um, it does definitely overlap with mental health. And a lot of the kids we're seeing in therapy have um, issues with um, drugs and alcohol, and we um, make referrals for treatment when that's appropriate. And we also really help them um, to come to a place of understanding that that might be an issue for them. And, um, you know, whatever level they're you know, they're, they're dealing with and have acknowledgement of that. But I, I think this, you want to speak to that too. It's a big, it's a big issue. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's anything new. 
um, you know, and I don't have I don't have necessarily concrete data from our district on that, but I think the biggest trend that we've seen again is the younger kids, which then we don't have that. Um, but you know, what I would say is a lot of it is just um, ensuring that the treatment aligns with what the kid needs and that everyone knows their role of how to then service that child in the school. So if you have a chemical counselor, mental health therapist, social worker, everybody has an understanding about what that student needs and what their role is in that education and treatment. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Commissioners, any follow-up questions or comments? Commissioner Roller. <coughs> uh, just a comment, um, and I, I made this comment to some school district folks last night at the Fire Lake uh, Community Fest. Mm -hmm. We have an organization called FISH, Families and Individuals Sharing Hope, and <coughs> we regularly meet student needs of all kinds. You know, they could be, and there, a lot of them are ones that government would never meet. Like we had some struggling family that couldn't afford uh, soccer equipment for their student or their, or cheerleader outfit for another one or and they can be school supplies or mentors or or whatever the, the gamut I'm sure there are things that affect someone's sense of well-being you know by the things they have or don't have you know or, or they can participate in or can't participate in it could be discouraged <coughs> um, I don't know why uh, Every school district, every teacher, every counselor, every principal isn't in the FISH network. I mean, a teacher sees needs. They could post a need for on behalf of a student. <coughs> I mean, we really uh, have a resource here. You say we need help, we need support. I mean, we can, there's, there are related things that could help. And so I would encourage you to, it's not trying, I'm not trying to give a commercial for FISH, but, <laughs> but really, um, it's, it's there for you. <clears throat> I can say from Southwest Metro, we get the fish request, so we get some of the requests, send it out to all our folks. I know mm -hmm. sometimes they've responded, and through the same vehicle, sometimes when we have need, we have funneled it back into the fish network. Okay. We do it through one of our staff people, but mm -hmm. yeah, fish has been very supportive and a very yeah. important piece of how we're serving kids already. Yeah, we've, we've definitely assigned our social worker in each building to be a part of that. So okay. definitely That's access great. it and have a point person that understands and knows the needs of our families above and beyond the school day. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Good to hear. A little education going both ways. Uh, Commissioner Beer. Thank you. Uh, one question, I may have missed it, but okay. what level of interaction are the parents, or what, when are the parents brought in? I imagine they're integral to this overall solution and sometimes perhaps part of the problem. But... You, you'd made the uh, example of, I don't know, Billy or Susie, but hey, I have feelings or emotions, I want to go see Sammy. At what point on the parent do, am I made aware of that? So um, when we, we don't, the therapist doesn't see a child until the parent signs um, permission. And then during the um, diagnostic assessment, which is the first thing that happens, the parent is there to give input. And then um, before we start therapy, there's a treatment planning process where the, ther the parent has input and signs the treatment plan. And then every 90 days, if unless there's a change uh, sooner, the parent is involved in that. I think, um, and Tanya, might, you might want to speak to this too, but um, the, for the younger kids especially, but also older kids, sometimes it's family therapy that they're doing. I know some of our therapists in the elementary schools call the parent every week for an, an update and to get feedback. Um, each therapist is a little bit different, but the parents are very much involved. Yeah, even before the referral, our school social workers will call that parent and inform them about the service in the schools. So they're brought in right away. This is a concern. <coughs> Have you thought about this? <coughs> Have that open dialogue. And I would say even, you know, um, not everybody knows but the school districts are responsible to provide services for birth to three. So kids that are birth to three years old that maybe have some developmental delays or at-risk types of needs. And so we have been able to tap into Scott County Mental Health Therapy Services to help even family support and consultation in that area too. So even at those young ages, trying to make sure that we have some support or intervention set up even prior to when they start preschool or kindergarten to make sure that that, that child doesn't fall through the cracks. Yep. Okay. Having raised four kids through adulthood, to adulthood, allegedly, <laughs> um, the teenage years were the most challenging, of course. So they were pretty well adjusted until they got to be like 13. And then they turned into these crazy people we didn't even know for a couple of years. 
When you're working with mental health uh, kind of issues in the schools, um, and particularly my girls, uh, for a couple of years they were almost unlivable, but by 15 they were good, they were friends again. I'm talking about puberty, of course. We've all been there, we all know that. How much of that factors into what we're doing here, or is that kind of already factored out of the equation? We're actually talking about deep underlying issues and not just hormonal changes from one day to the next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, yeah, I mean, we certainly look at normal development and normal, you know, um, things that you see developmentally. And um, the kids that we're seeing are um, the ones that have, beyond that, have emotional or behavioral issues beyond what is typical. If I could just add to that a little bit, I think that's the importance of having the collaboration and the working relationship between the mental health therapists, <coughs> which school personnel aren't mm -hmm. trained in those areas. We've all had counselors and social workers when we were growing up mm -hmm. and they, you know, the, the counselor for many of us was to help us to get into a college or decide mm -hmm. what to do with your life, um, which is very important, but their role has even changed also. And then really until we've had the support and the help and the collaboration of the therapists, many times we were treading in, in waters that we really didn't want to be. Uh, we wanted to stay focused on the, the social worker and the guidance and the counseling work and the teacher work. But my comment is, is our teachers and the people that work in schools are professionals uh, in the sense of being able to, like a parent, separate what is potentially puberty and just normal age and what is something serious. And that is so important also since the full-time therapists have come into our district, we've been able to utilize those folks for training with all of our staff. And that support, so you think about it, one therapist walking into an elementary school of 650. Or if you can also get that one therapist to come to some staff development, professional development, <coughs> and visit with and talk about mental health, suicide, depression to 75 staff members, now we've really got some things going because that's 75 sets of eyes versus one set. And if we kind of have a little bit of an idea of what to look for, for some of our more serious situations, all of our staff can do that versus just, you know, not really knowing what to look for. Well, thank you. Uh, any other comments or anyone compelled? To Commissioner um, Thank you, thank you. It's so good to see you all here, and I, I like to see the, the partnerships. Um, Tony, thanks so much for your testimonial. It was wonderful. Um, but that got me thinking about, about something, and I'm trying to think of the right way to say it. It has to do with credit. And I don't think the county needs credit for this because we should be doing it. But then on the other hand, I deal with taxpayers all the time who are concerned about the bills and, and, and the tax, uh, what they have to pay to Scott County. I wonder with a program like this that's doing so good and so much collaboration, if there's uh, any room or if you have any ideas about how to make sure that people realize, even though it's through the schools, they think of Sammy is from school, whatever, that the county's involved, that their tax dollars are supporting this great program, that because we're all working together, it's costing less and hopefully doing more good. Um, they expect to hear those things from me, and they usually don't believe me. But um, I think to make sure that, that every, if, if that's all true, which it sounds like it is, how can we better communicate that from the people in the field to the people they're serving or, or other stakeholders? Any ideas? I can talk about what we've already done. Um, we've had presentations to our school board just mm -hmm. to get the information out there. Um, we've also had a lot of, because it's, it's, it's different than what we've done in the past. So a lot of education for our staff. We have a lot of staff that live in our district. So word of mouth is very powerful, as you know. So just making sure staff understand how that works and what, why it's different than maybe how a teacher is hired in the district, for example. So a lot of that, we just have a lot of conversations to make sure people understand that. We've had the therapists actually come talk about that too. Great. And then usually I'm there with, so then you have that partnership modeled as well during the presentation. So that's what we've done in our part to make sure that people in our community and our schools understand how that relationship works. Thank so. you. 
Yeah, social media is something that, uh, you know, we use a lot of things for social media to get the word out. Kind of like what we started the conversation with. When you start talking mental health, you got to be just a little bit, it's not one of those glamorous things that you want to just throw out that you're doing, right? You know, expectations. But as we send out an annual report from our school district mm -hmm. every year, and I'm thinking of that as mm -hmm. I help put it together, we send out close to 20,000. Every address in the New Prague School District gets an annual report. It's a very nice, put together, well bound um, publication and an article in there about the, the work that uh, we're doing with Scott County uh, in the New Prague Area Schools, I think would be an amazing thing that would get on a lot of eyes and I'd be more than happy to put that together and then also share that with the other school districts that Terry gives me and, and see if they can't do something the same too. Mm -hmm. That'd be That's great. great. Yeah. Thank you. I think Commissioner Weckman, I was just going to add, as we're working on our people's report, um, Brad and Claire, um, this was not one of them that we had featured, at least in this first go around, but it is something we could consider too, along with a story, along with the data and some of those info type graphics that we're working on to communicate some of these major things the board is moving forward. <clears throat> And, you know, I, there is the other piece of the funding because, so the question we hear about how does this get paid for, we run reflections, a day treatment program, we team with Terry Shop here with the county. Now, if you look on the surface, they bring to you, and thank you all very much for supporting that contract, because that's between Southwest Metro and the county, but it looks like we're contracting to pay a quarter of a million dollars a year for these services. So if you just take that snapshot, wow, there's a quarter of a million dollars of public money being spent. What gets missed is Terry and the county team then going back and getting that third party reimbursement. In the last couple quarters, the reimbursement has paid for, if not all, virtually all of that cost. So we're contracting to guarantee we'll pay the amount, but that's after the insurance and other third party reimbursement is off. Our bills are minuscule, and yet, that, and that's a program we didn't, that's above and beyond what we're talking about here today. That's full day treatment for kids that is kind of this hidden gem that's out there that we're providing to kids across Carver and Scott counties mm -hmm. um, for very, very few resources. Although on the surface to the commissioners, it looks like, well, there's a quarter million dollars being spent on. It's not because that's the guarantee, but it doesn't take into account those other resources. I think that's an important point, both the day treatment component and for priority-based budgeting purposes, we kind of see, we treat that as a program and then the school link mental health we treat as a program, but really it's small cost as far as um, county levy is concerned, and then kind of nominal contracts also really by the school district as well. So uh, I think getting the word out and kind of talking about really the all the quality and all the staff and the therapists that go into this for relatively uh, a small amount of, of taxpayer fee is, is, is really interesting, and when you think of um, you know, keep staring at the delivering what matters that's across the top of the, the page on all of these. And, you know, each individual student that's in the school that's receiving those services are going to hopefully someday get a big chunk of them into being citizens within the county, um, potentially future workforce. So it's really delivering the service that really matters to that future citizen. So for really at a low cost. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Shelton. Um, Question just for uh, Terry, and I, I moved the projector back to this slide from page five, and, and you had talked about uh, this when the question was asked earlier that the GAF score was a measure that you do when they enter the program and a measure you do when they are discharged from therapy or whatever program they happen to be in. And My, my question was on the, the yellow and the red. So there's a percentage to show no change, there's a small percentage that that show they actually their functioning decreased. If they're being discharged from the program and they fall into that those two categories, um, where do they go then? I mean, are they put into a different type of a therapy? <coughs> do they transition to somebody else? I, I'm assuming you don't just say, "Well, you know, we tried, uh, you didn't get better, or you got worse." Uh, you know, so so what is the next step if 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 they're being discharged in that gap, they fall into that? It's a small percentage. Um, but what happens with those kids? Well, the thing about mental health therapy services is that it's voluntary. So many of what you're seeing here are people who 
um, decided to end services. Um, obviously, when we do, well, maybe not obviously, but when we do a, a discharge summary, we make recommendations about what would be helpful. Um, if they're leaving our services um, against medical advice or without completing the services. Sometimes, as we talked about before, it act, people come to see us and we need to put them in the hospital. Like it's a crisis, it's a crisis appointment, and um, they they need to go to the hospital. They're not someone we've been seeing all along. Now, occasionally, we will have um, clients, and this speaks to Lisa's uh, issue um, or question, and some others where there might be something that we we can't treat. Maybe they have a primary eating disorder that's life threatening, and they need to go to an inpatient eating disorder clinic, and we'll make that recommendation. Uh, maybe they um, have a primary chemical health issue and need to get um, CD treatment before their therapy. Um, and so we'll make that recommendation. So we always, and then, uh, and then sometimes there's issues in school where they might need a different academic setting. And so we certainly work with the schools um, about that and make recommendations that are, you know, for the best fit and the best hopeful outcome for the client. Thank you. Well, thank you for your work with the students and for uh, collaboration. It, that's, that's great to see that we're working together for the presentation this morning. Thank you very much. Members, absent any other comments or uh, questions or anything for the good of the cause, uh, the chair will entertain the most famous motion of all. Second. And your motion is second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. We are adjourned. Thank you.